Hi, it's Heather from Thicket Works, and today I'm going to share the process for creating this miniature bird bath. In addition, we'll be making this beautiful garden table. Both of these projects will be included start to finish in today's tutorial. There's a link in the description to a helpful, free, downloadable printable that you can use to help create both of these miniature pieces. I hope you enjoy the process as much as I have. Now before we get started, here's a few words about the courses that I offer. If you enjoy the free content that you find here on my channel, but you'd like to dive deeper, consider joining us for Mixed Media for Beginners, Mixed Media 2, or the Online Image Transfer Workshop. All of these courses contain in-depth material and walk you step-by-step step through processes that will help you take your work to the next level. There's a link in the description where you can view each class curriculum and decide whether or not these experiences are right for you. Okay, back to today's video. The process for both of these pieces begins with one of these three inch high wooden candle holders. I'm just wrapping an old rag around this one and clamping it into a vise. Then I'm using a saw in order to remove the candle cup at the top of this piece. I'll complete this for two of these candlesticks and that will give us the base for both our garden table and the miniature bird bath. After some sanding, the top becomes a little smoother, but it's definitely going to take a bit more work to get this into shape. Now we can see how each of these supports will function together with the pieces that we'll be cutting from the printable. There are instructions on the printable itself which help you decide which of the circles need to be cut from foam core board and which from chipboard. Now because I work with foam core board so often, I've decided to invest in some specialty tools and one of them is this circle cutter by Foamworks. It works on the same principle as a beam compass. Here I'm demonstrating how the beam portion can be removed from the larger piece and then we can install one of the specialty blades into the end of that beam and then reinstall the clamping mechanism. The instructions that come with this circle cutter are very clear and easy to follow. So I'm just reading the instructions and doing what they tell me to do. Now I'm reinserting the beam back into the main body of the tool and loosely clamping it down. You can see that there are measurements marked on that beam, but from everything I've read and from my own experience, those measurements aren't that helpful. However, that center post is very helpful and the fact that it retracts is very crucial to how this operates. Be careful once that blade is installed because it remains exposed and it is very sharp. It's important to use a double layer of foam core. Here I'm just using a glue stick to apply the printable on top of the upper layer of foam core board. And now I'm turning the winder counterclockwise in order to retract the blade so that it is now raised above the lower surface of the tool. This will allow me to make adjustments to the width of the circle that it will cut without actually digging into the paper or the material. Here I'm just making a rough estimate of where the blade should fall and after a few tries I finally get it where I need it to be and I center that post on the dot in the middle of the circle. Now I hold the tool firmly and carefully wind it clockwise. 
the blade is being dragged around the material and is slowly descending with each turn of the handle. This is why it's so important to have a sacrificial board underneath the upper layer that you're cutting. Otherwise, you'll dull the blade almost immediately on your cutting surface. Once the cut is complete, it's important to wind counterclockwise until the blade retracts. Otherwise, it will hit the surface of whatever you put it down on, it'll dull the blade, and it might hurt the surface. Now I've adjusted the width of the beam again and am cutting the second circle and then retracting the blade. Once that first circle has been cut, now I'm readjusting the width of the blade and cutting the inner circle of what looks like a donut. I leave the outer circle in place so that it's all held together. There we go. Okay, time to retract the blade again. This is a rhythm that you have to train yourself to get into. These two pieces will form the upper basin of our miniature birdbath. I finally decided to use a pair of dividers to help me determine the width of the blade and that seems to be a really successful method of getting it right without so much fiddling around. I have to say I'm really impressed with the clean edges of these cuts. I wasn't exactly sure what to expect but I am pleasantly surprised. Investing in a tool like this doesn't make sense unless, of course, you fall in love with foam board the same way that I have. I really wish that this tool came with a way to protect the blade, but since it didn't, I just cut a little piece of cork and am using that to guard both the blade and any surfaces it might come in contact with. The foam core is an important part of this build, but so are the chipboard layers. I'm tracing out the center of that donut shape and now I'm using my Olfa circle cutter in order to create circular cutouts from the chipboard as well. All these materials layered together are what will give the final pieces their feeling of substantiality and will also help to keep them structurally sound. I'm also tracing out the large circle shape and piercing right through that dot in the center so that it's super easy to find the middle of this circle when adjusting my circle cutter. Okay, so those two pieces are now cut out and we can see how they will layer. In order to join everything together, I'm using one of these little pin vices in order to drill holes into approximately the center of each of the little wooden candlesticks. This is going to make it possible for me to use fasteners to clamp down the upper layers of chipboard onto the top of each of these pedestals. Now that these pilot holes are in place, I can apply 3-in-1 adhesive to the top of the candlesticks. And once that adhesive has been laid down, now it's time to pick up a screwdriver and some small scale screws, line them up with the pilot holes, and install them. I find that the wood that is used to create these wooden candlesticks is extremely dense and creating the pilot holes is an absolute necessity if I want to be able to drive in these screws. Now they don't fit all the way flush but it's a good start. Yep, I'm liking the basic shapes that we've established here. Very cool. Okay, now I'm going to trace around the white line that circumnavigates the edge of the largest foam board circular disc. 
this creates a pilot line that I'll be using to help me bevel that edge. I'm just reinforcing that guideline with the rounded tip of a small paintbrush. And now removing all of the protective paper from all of the discs that have been cut so far. Now I'm just creating an imprint on the underside of the exposed foam and then reinforcing that with the end of a tool so that now when I attempt to layer these together there won't be any gaps. I'm using super thick tacky glue as my adhesive of choice to join together the foam core and the chipboard. I'll repeat the same type of process on the larger piece, the one that makes up the top of the garden table. So I've impressed the top and I'm reinforcing that divot and now I'm slathering the top of the chipboard with the adhesive prior to applying the disc of foam core board on top. And finally I'll be layering the donut structure on top of this disc as well. But an important part of this process is to create a slight bevel on the disc that will be below the donut ring. Now I'm not the best at beveling or creating a chamfer so I go super slow and I take this in little tiny chunks. I'm confident that with the use of some sanding tools, we'll be able to clean up that bevel so that it looks really nice. So here comes the trusty Emery board. And as usual, it does a great job of helping to smooth out that transitional angle. Now, you may have noticed, like I have, that the donut ring is slightly off center. And I'm not very happy about that. but I'll worry about it in a minute after I round off the upper edges of the exterior of that ring. Yep, that's looking pretty good. To deal with this offset in the center cut, I've created a jig for sanding that's just a cardboard tube with some, I think it's 220 grit sandpaper attached to the exterior. And this allows me to carefully sand away material until I've established what feels like a more balanced circular ring. Yep, I'm happier with that. And I like the way these two pieces are now fitting together. The next step is to join them permanently together again with the super thick tacky glue. Now there's some glue squeeze out that happens when I press these together. So I'll just use a dampened brush to help clean that up before allowing the piece to dry. There, nice and smooth. Now I'll turn to the pedestal and round the upper edge of that disc. In order to fill in the gap between the chipboard and the foam core board, I'm reaching for joint compound and applying that along the edge and doing my best to smooth it out. Now I'm going to chamfer the edge of the tabletop. This is important only because I'm going to be using a particular mold to add a decorative motif around the edge. And I don't want that mold to protrude too much above the surface of the table itself. So creating that angle will allow me to apply the casting without adding a disproportionate ridge around the edge. Again, I'm reaching for joint compound to smooth out that transition at the edge. 
After assessing the design of the bird feeder, I've decided to add two more discs of chipboard to act as a foot beneath the pedestal. Now I'm just eyeballing the sizes of these discs. Yep, that's going to help. This will increase the stability of the piece and also help it to be more visually harmonious. I'm just using the cheapest super glue that I can find and attaching these discs to each other. Using that center point to make sure that they're layered correctly. And then attaching the base of the pedestal to the uppermost disc. In order to make sure that this dries true and straight, I'm just adding a 1-2-3 block on top and setting it aside to cure. There, now we have the basis for our miniature bird bath. To give the bottom of the pedestal a little more weight, and to make it a little more visually pleasing to my eye, I'm adding a thin snake of air dry clay right around the base of the pedestal and then joining it together at the ends and smoothing it out with a damp paintbrush and a very simple modeling tool. Here's the mold that I'm using to decorate the edge of the table. This is one of the same decorative molds that was used to create the miniature classical fountain and also to embellish the garden benches. The castings are held in place with tacky glue and then I use a dampened brush to make sure that the edges are all firmly affixed. Once the pieces have dried, it's time to seal them and I'm turning to heavy white gesso for this operation. The crucial step is to seal the top of the bird bath very carefully because it's going to contain a layer of resin. Now it's time to repeat our layered paint finish. It's basically the same finish that's been used in all of the Secret Garden miniature pieces that have been created thus far. Beginning with a light gray, and then a black wash, and then applying layers of glazing. It's simply acrylic craft paint blended together with clear floor polish. Now, if you use a heat tool to dry between your layers of glazing like I do, be super careful because allowing the heat to build up on any one area of foam core board is going to result in disaster. So keep the tool moving and don't allow it to melt your hard work. Once all the layers of glaze are in place, I'm adding a stippled layer of simple straight acrylic craft paint in a mint green. This is sort of a stippled slash dry brushing technique that just leaves a sort of scratchy layer of pigment on the surface. Now I'm using a thinned version of PVA glue applied to the surfaces in the places where I want it to appear as though moss has gathered. Yep, we've done this several times before. If you're not familiar with the process, go back and watch the other videos in this series. You'll see this is a technique I turn to again and again. I'm using pulverized cilantro leaves. I get my cilantro in the spice section of the grocery store or the dollar store and then I just grind it up with a craft only coffee grinder. Once all the moss has been applied, I take extra care to seal all of it with a matte medium. 
This is going to be especially important around the upper edge of the bird bath because we're going to be adding UV resin. Now, UV resin is wonderful stuff and I love it to pieces, but it does have some issues when you're working on a foam core surface. Here's what I mean. When the UV resin cures, as it will with the use of a UV flashlight, it tends to heat up and it also tends to shrink a little bit and can curl at the edges. So this is a process best approached in a layering system. Try not to cure more than about an eighth of an inch of the resin at a time. You can see that my under layer here has cracked just slightly. Now, I'm not too worried about it in this instance, but if it's mission critical to your piece, be very careful with how you apply and cure the UV resin. Now, the UV resin pulled away slightly from the edges and also created a raised rim. So to deal with that issue, I thought, you know, I've seen accumulated algae and moss that create a kind of raised effect around water that's been sitting stagnant for a long time. So I'll replicate that look by using triple thick and more of the ground cilantro around the edges and then adding one final thin layer of UV resin in the center of all this mossy goodness. If I hadn't had the problem with the resin in the first place, it probably wouldn't have occurred to me to create the sort of raised edges. But I gotta tell you, I love the way that it looks. I'm really glad that happened. Here's a shot of the upper surface. And here's a side view of this same piece. Our table fits perfectly together with the garden benches that we created previously. And bit by bit, this secret garden is coming together. I hope that you're enjoying this series because I'm having a wonderful time creating all of these pieces. I hope that at the very least you come away with a greater appreciation for what foam core and regular chipboard, cheap acrylic craft paints, joint compound, some glue, and some dried spices can do for your work. Oh, and don't forget the floor polish. That stuff's crucial. Thank you again for taking the time out of your day to watch this video and for hanging out with me in this studio. It's much appreciated, my friends. Until next time, bye.